This is the first FRQ is on atomic structure. If you'd like to try this problem before I go through the solution, you can find the link to the Google Doc with it in the description below. I'm going to get started. So, first problem in here asks us to complete this chart. Very simple. So we have a sodium ion, sodium ion, sodium atom. 23 mass number 24, 23. So any sodium atom or ion is going to have 11 protons. And then for the number of neutrons, the mass number here is the total number of things in the nucleus. So it's how many protons and neutrons combined. So we have 12 neutrons here to give us 23 total things. We have 13 in this particular ion to give us 24 total things. And we have 12 here as well. So you can subtract the mass number and the atomic number to get those neutrons. For the electrons, all sodium atoms will have the same number of protons and electrons. All atoms will have the same number of protons and electrons. So this one will have 11, but the ions have had electrons uh, added or removed. In this case, they've had one removed. So we have one more proton and electron to give us a plus one charge. Okay. And likewise here, 10 electrons to give us a plus one charge. Now, from that, in part B it says, describe the paths that each of these would take in a mass spectrometer. Okay, so let's go ahead and flip boards here for a second. So, here is our entrance into the mass spectrometer. We inject our sample into here. Uh, this is a little unusual because usually at that point you would ionize or atomize these things. Uh, we're just going to assume that these three things are what's coming out of this uh, particular part. And then they're going to go through the magnetic field where they're going to deflect. So we're going to do a deflection mass spectrometer, not a time of flight or something else. Uh, and then there's going to be a detector. It's going to be able to tell where these hit and then send off that signal. So for the sodium 23 atom, if that were somehow to emit from here at some speed, that would just continue in a straight line and go off. The fact that it has the same number of protons and electrons means that it won't have a net effect from the magnetic field, and so therefore it won't deflect. Now, the sodium 23 plus, having a positive charge is going to make that interact with the magnetic field in a way that's going to cause it to deflect. So it's going to hit somewhere on that detector. Okay. So then the big question is, well, what happens with an isotope? So the isotope is more massive. Now the force is based on charge. So the two ion, or yeah, I'm sorry, the two ions here will experience the same force. So this and this, but this one has more mass. And so because this has more mass with the same force, this will have less acceleration, which means that it's going to be more difficult to cause this change its velocity, it means it's not going to deflect as much. So what we're going to see from this is we're going to see it very close to this, but it's going to hit at a slightly smaller deflection than the other. And so we can get two separate signals if our detector has a way to distinguish these, perhaps some kind of channel with a wire coming out of each, and then we can figure out how much uh, sodium-23 we have, how much sodium-24. So from the amount of current produced here and the amount of current produced here, we can get an isotopic ratio of those two particular things. Okay. Our next question goes into light absorption and emission process. Why 23 and 24 sodium plus ions would have the same light frequency emissions? So the light emission process is that you have an electron in some kind of uh, manner of path around the atom. Okay. And, and then what happens is, is when light comes in and, and it kind of is absorbed by that electron or interacts with that electron, that electron will then move up to a different, you know, uh, speed and, and energy uh, and path around that atom that's at a higher energy state. Okay. 
So when the light is absorbed, the electron will go up into a higher energy level. And then once that's up there, that electron will then collapse back down to a lower energy level, perhaps back to a brown state. And, and then that happens, your light gets re-emitted in some new direction. Okay. So the question is, why would 23 sodium plus and 24 sodium plus have the same light frequency emissions? So why would they both absorb the same yellow light or the same green light? And the answer to that is because these energy levels and their spacing is dictated by all of the protons and electrons and their structure within the atom. So, so what's happening here is this electron is moving while protons are pulling it in some direction and electrons are pushing it in a, in a myriad of directions. And based on all of those forces, it, it tells us, or, or tell us, but, but it gives a gap. So that's what sets how big this gap is. If I add another proton to this, then it's going to require more energy for me to move this into a higher level, so there's going to be a bigger gap. If I had another electron, well then now it's a little easier to push this. So, so there are things, so these number of protons and electrons and, and how they're structured in the atom will influence how big of a gap these are between the different energy levels. And so, sodium 23 plus and sodium 24 plus have the same number of electrons, same number of protons, right? So 11 protons, 10 electrons, and they both are in the same structure. So their electron configuration, uh, the way they're set up into you know, states within the uh, atom are the same and identical, and so therefore we'd expect to see the very same light frequency emissions from those two different things. Okay, 3s1 electrons promoted to the 5s orbital state, then light would be absorbed. And write out the quantum numbers for the valence electron in its ground state and the excited state from part B, 5s. So in the ground state, we have, we have our four quantum numbers. We have the principal quantum number, which is what energy level. So for a 3s1 electron, our n would be 3. The L is your angular quantum number. And this is what, what type of orbital uh, that we're describing this electron with. And so for an s orbital, L is 0. For p orbital, L is 1. D is 2. F is 3. G is 4. So on. For m, it's which orbital? So 3s1, there's only one orbital of s nature in each energy level. <coughs> so, so the m's start at 0, and then as you move out, they go up and down. So for just 1, the only option we have is for 0. And then finally, the spin can be up or down, so we could have plus one half or minus one half. Either one is fine. In our excited state, now we're going to go up into a 5s orbital. So for our n, we're changing from n equals 3 to n equals 5. Our energy level has changed. For our angular quantum number, we're still in an s orbital, so our l would still be 0. If we move to a p orbital, our L would be 1, so on. And being in an s orbital, our m value is still going to be 0, because there's only one s orbital in the fifth energy level. So our m start at 0 and move out from there. So the spin, again, whatever you had picked previously, uh, I'm not going to go through the restrictions on transitions uh, for spin, uh, which is a higher level concept than what we're going for here. Uh, but again, if you picked either plus or minus one half, that would have been sufficient. <coughs>